Well, today we're going to be receiving some people into membership at Battle Creek First Church of the Nazarene. And as the pastor of this family of faith, I am very excited today because it means that our family is growing. Now, these individuals, on the one hand, have said, yes, I buy into the mission of First Church. And that mission is to be Christ-like disciples who make Christ-like disciples. And so, so these individuals have said, yes, I, I want to be a part of that mission. I, I believe in that. I believe in what's happening here, whether it's in the ministries of the church or, or whatever that may be. And, and so we're glad about that. But we can't forget that while these folks are saying yes to the mission, they're also saying yes to the fellowship of, the, of, of all of the people who are represented here. And so what they are saying today is that they not only want to be a part of our mission and vision, but they also want to be a part of, of us. And, and so today we say to them, you belong here. Uh, we are your family. If, if you want to be a part of who we are, we open wide our arms to you and say, you, you belong. Uh, now, why do we have membership in this church? Uh, well, what's membership all about? Well, well simply put, Membership is a shift in mindset from someone who says, I attend this church to this is my church. And that's a huge shift. Just as Christ committed to his church, so also these people who are becoming members are expressing their commitment to this church. And in an age where very few people want to be committed to anything, and this American society has produced a generation of church shoppers and hoppers, these new members are making an unselfish decision to commit to this local body of believers. Now, there's also a practical component to membership. Every team has a roster. Every school has an enrollment. Every business has a payroll. Every army has an enlistment. So also, membership helps us to identify who can be counted on. Now, all of that being said, um, I know that there are, are some, of, some of you here who are just as committed to this church as any other member, but yet you are not a formal member, and we want to say that we give room for that as well. I'd like to read for you a passage from Romans chapter 12. It says this, For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. I'd like to invite those who have who have decided to become members to come forward and stand up here on on the platform with me. And I know you guys are all cringing right now. Like, oh no, I don't want to have to do that. It's okay. I won't ask you to do that every week. So here we have David and Nancy Dake. We have Keith Jones. We have Gabe Bielan and Teresa Luzanaris. And we have Joanne and Tom Joy. We have Tanya Van Noti. So these are our eight new members of the church. Now, I want to share with you a little bit about, about what we've talked about in membership class. In, in, in certain essential beliefs, in those essential beliefs, we ask for unity on them. And remember, we talked about that. But there are also some non-essential beliefs. And with those non-essential beliefs, we say there's some liberty. Uh, there's some freedom for difference of opinion and, ch- and, and, and different perspectives. But in all things, we say we call for charity, for love to be expressed in all things. Now, In those essential beliefs, um, the statement is rather brief. I'd like to read it for you. Here is the essential. We believe in God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We especially emphasize the deity of Jesus Christ and the personality of the Holy Spirit. We believe that human beings are born in sin and that they need the work of forgiveness through Jesus Christ and the new birth which happens by the Holy Spirit. We also believe that there is a deeper work of heart cleansing where we give our eternal yes to God. 
and that the Holy Spirit guides us along in our walk of faith and assures us in our lives that we are never forsaken, we are never abandoned. We believe that our Lord will return and that the dead shall be raised and that all shall come to final judgment with its rewards and punishments. And so, new members, do you heartily believe these truths? If so, answer, I do. Do you acknowledge Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, and do you realize that He saves you now? If so, answer, I do. So, not only do we talk about, in membership, about these things that you have to believe, or we say these are the essentials of belief. We also talk about essentials of action. You know, what what we are calling people to to, to live like, what what we expect their lives to look like. And and so we ask all of our members to commit to doing the following. And, And the first is to protect the unity of our church by acting in love toward other members, by refusing to gossip, and by, uh, by, by following its leaders. If you commit to protect the unity of the church, would you respond, I will? We also ask our members to share in the responsibility of our church by, by praying for its growth, by inviting the unchurched to attend, and by warmly welcoming those who visit. If you commit to share the responsibility of our church, would you respond, I will? will. We ask our members to serve the ministry of our church, but by discerning our own personal spiritual gifts and talents and using them for the furtherance of the kingdom, but by being equipped by the pastors and by developing a servant's heart so that as someone takes leadership in the church, it is understood that it is servant leadership. If you commit to serving the ministry of our church, would you respond, I will? And then lastly, we ask our members to support the testimony of our church by faithfully attending our weekly worship gatherings by living a godly life in the community, and by giving of our financial means. If you commit to support the testimony of our church, would you respond, I will? I will. will. All right. Okay. These are for David and Nancy. And then this is your certificate of membership. David, I want to welcome you to membership at First Church of the Nazarene. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Nancy, I want to welcome you into membership at First Church of the Nazarene. Now, I got to tell you, we had David and Nancy over at our home a few, a few weeks ago when they first started coming to our church, and I found out that, uh, that David likes to work in sound. And so you could imagine how I really caught on to that and said, oh, well, we've got a place for you. And we always need people to help with sound. So, and Nancy comes to our Wednesday night Bible studies, and man, she can make an amazing cake. If you want to know the recipe to the cake, you got to ask her. So we are so glad that you are a part of our church, and, and we love you guys, and we're so glad that you are joining fellowship of this body. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you. And Keith, I want to welcome you into membership at First Church of the Nazarene. Applaud. (laughs) You know, come here. Just because he's grown up here doesn't mean we're not excited today, right? I mean, this guy is great. And one of the things I want to share about Keith, and I know he hates this right now, so I'm going to stand over here, okay? I'm going to stand over here. (laughs) Yes, within arm's reach. So Keith and I, uh, remember, you know, about a year ago when I was really hammering those life transformation groups and I was throwing out pamphlets at you guys every time I preached and I said, be a part of an LTG and all that? Well, well, Keith was one of the crazy ones who said, yes, I'll do that. 
you know? And so Keith and I have been meeting every week at the local McDonald's, and every week Keith comes having listened to the book of the Bible that we're reading and, and growing together, and it's just been phenomenal to see the growth that has occurred, not only in my own life, but especially in Keith's life since doing LTG. So I want to welcome you warmly into membership. So there you go. All right. Yeah, I know. Speed it up, Pastor. Speed it up. Okay. All right. Teresa, there you go. Gabe, there you go. I want to welcome you into membership at First Church of the Nazarene. Welcome. And Teresa, welcome. So, a, l- a, little, a little bit about Gabe and Teresa. Gabe and Teresa started coming to our church a few months ago. Um, Gabe was in the military where he, he, he got really close to one of the chaplains in the military who happened to be uh, a Nazarene. And so Gabe started coming to our church, and Gabe and Teresa are engaged, by the way. So they're going to be getting married. When is the, the big date? June 9th of 2018. June 9th of 2018. So there's, that's the big day. Um, and uh, G- Gabe is, he's passionate about ministry. Uh, Gabe is seminary trained, uh, an excellent scholar. And Gabe loves, he, he loves working with, uh, with youth especially, right? Youth and, and, yeah, and music and music. Yeah, Gabe is working with Pastor Hannah on music. And Teresa is, is a native of Puerto Rico, lived in, in Michigan for three years now, mm-hmm. and is an optometrist in town. Mm-hmm. So uh, they're both a wonderful couple, really warm. You're going to love them. So I encourage you to get to know them. So let's give them a hand. All right. Thank you, Joanne, Tom. All right, Joanne, I want to welcome you into membership at First Church of the Nazarene. Tom, I want to welcome you into membership at First Church of the Nazarene. All right, so, so Joanne is our star softball player. Uh, she, she played with us in the league last spring. I mean, she was a heavy hitter. She was our star first baseman. She's, she's got it down. Uh, so if you want someone to play softball, Joanne's got you. And Tom, Tom is such a jokester. He's hilarious. I encourage you to get to know this wonderful couple. Tom is absolutely hilarious. Uh, but he's a lot of fun, and uh, so I just it's been wonderful to, to have you a part of our church. And also your two children, Ava and Emma, we welcome them as well. And I know that they're just having a great time in Children's Church right now. So welcome to membership. Thank Glad you. to have you guys. All right, Tanya, there you go. And I want to welcome you into membership at First Church of the Nazarene. So... Now, Tanya became connected with our church through the daycare. You know, she was sending Adiana, her oldest child, into our daycare program, and, uh, and uh, she became connected to our church through that. And so Tanya has three children, Adiana, Charlie, and Caden, right? Yep. I got the last right. Caden is the baby. So um, Tanya is, is a phenomenal woman of God. She loves the Lord, and she loves the church, and she has such a warm personality as well. I encourage you to get to know Tanya uh, she's, an, she's an amazing woman. She's blessed Peggy, encouraged Peggy tremendously with his hand, Compassion Ministries, and just loves, loves this church. And so would you all just stand and warmly welcome them? I invite you guys to come on down, walk on down, and uh, head back to your seats, but just want to say welcome. God bless you, man. You can tell I'm excited. You may be seated, maybe a little bit, maybe a little bit, maybe a little bit. This, these are exciting times for our church, exciting times for our church. And uh, uh, we have Pastor Will coming to speak with us. Now, many of you know that Pastor Will was on a short-term mission trip, our district short-term mission trip to Honduras, where they uh, did some water purification things, uh, installed some water filters and some wells, or just water filters. Just water filters. They installed some water filters. They also built a soccer field, which is really cool. I, I did have the privilege of going on the Michigan District's Work and Witness Project this, uh, well, this month. We went November 1st through the 12th, and this started over a year ago. 
district assembly, not this past summer, but the summer before, they announced that our district project for the year would be to, to raise $20,000 and, and that they would be sending some of us to Honduras to, to do some water fil- purification and, and maybe build a soccer field and, and who knows what else. And, and so I want to say thank you to you because your church participated in the raising of some of those funds. And so you have, whether you knew it or not, you have a part in this trip, which is partly why I'm here today, to, to say thank you and let you know uh, of what your, your money and your prayers have gone towards. And I was privileged to go, and I had to raise my own money. The, the money that you all contributed towards the project went to the project. And the 31 of us who went, we had to raise our own money to get ourselves there. And so all of your money went to what it was supposed to go to. And I love that about the Church of the Nazarene. I didn't love raising my own money, but I did love that, that all the money went to the project. And we, the project was called Hope for Honduras. And, and some of you may be wondering, where is Honduras? Others, you know exactly where it is. But where is Honduras? And Honduras is, is in Central America, located between Guatemala and Nicaragua. It, it is a, a Spanish culture for the most part, but it does have so, some Caribbean influence as well because the, the Caribbean borders the, the western side of it, and so you get a little bit of influence there. But Honduras is actually considered the poorest country in the western hemisphere. And, and they also, this, this varies from year to year, but they, they oftentimes are the murder capital of the world. And they, right now, they actually have some political unrest. The, in their constitution, it says that if the president even makes a motion to extend term limits, that he, is, he or she, it's generally he, but he is to, to be removed immediately from office. Well, the current president, Juan Orlando, he fired some judges, and then he put some other judges in place, and then he made a motion that term limits could be extended, and those judges who he put there said, yes, that's okay. And so he now is running for president again, and there are protests. And actually, there was a big protest down the street from our hotel where we stayed. So right now, there, there's some, some instability. And they, they also, they are rich in resources. They have so much fruit and coffee. You drive down, down the roads, and you see the coffee out in the, the fields, sugarcane, uh, lots of minerals, but uh, one of the problems is your, your everyday person sees almost none of that money. It's going to the wealthy, it's going to corporations, and, and you've heard the term banana republic. That actually started in Honduras where American fruit companies went down and, and they had their fruit companies and basically took the bananas and the money with them and, and have left the people there with, with almost nothing. And, and some of that's changed, but they, they still are a very, very poor people. And and so that's, they speak Spanish, and that's a little bit about Honduras. What we did, what, as Pastor Ryan told you, is we, we installed some water filtration systems. We actually put in two of them, and, and these, these systems, they were, were pretty basic. Uh, you have a, a water, water filter and some PVC that has to be arranged in certain ways. And, and so a few of our guys on the team were able to, to go to two different churches and install these water filtration systems. And the church we stayed with, they already had one. So, so now there are three of them in that immediate area. And, and the beautiful part about this, it, several, several beautiful things. One, this is not beautiful. You cannot drink the water there. The, the local people, will, they pretty much will not drink the water unless they're really desperate. It is bad. It's actually so bad that we, we saw a lot of babies or, or toddlers with bottles, and they had pop in them. And, and my first thought was, what kind of parent does that? Except someone, someone said, well, it's because of the water. They can't drink the water, and so your choice is you give the baby this terrible water or you give them pop. You're going to give them pop even though it'll rot their teeth and it's not good for them because it's better than the water. And, and so we, we wanted to help with that. And so we put in these water filtration systems, which the church is able to, to get clean drinking water for the church, but then they're also able to sell it to their community. And they sell it at a very, very reasonable price. They can, people can afford it. And, and so now they have drinking water, the church has drinking water, and then the money that the church gets for the water allows them to maintain the, the system, because you do need new filters. They're supposed to last 20 years. 
if they're properly maintained. So every 20 years, a new filter, but you also have to, to maintain the system. And so it's, it enables them to do that and also for programs to be built at the church. They can do ministry with this money as well. And so it, it's multifaceted, tons of benefits from it. And at the very least, health benefits for the church people and the community. And so we were excited to do that. And, and I, I don't know how much time I have. So I'm plenty. plenty. Okay. I, I should have said this at the beginning. Uh, well, how did I end up going on this trip? I, I was at district assembly when they announced it. And I thought, I'd really like to do that. I don't know. And then they said it's the first, at the time it was the first 20 people who put a $100 deposit, you're on the team. And so, well, I don't know. And then they said, and if you can't go, it's refundable. I'm there. So I put my, I put my deposit just in case. And over the next few months, I'm going to go, no, I can't go. I can't afford this and time off and, and this and that. And, and I went back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And then finally, I had to make a decision, and the Lord spoke to me and said, Will, do you love me? Well, yes, Lord, I, I love you. Do you love people? Most of the time, uh, yes, Lord. Uh, <laughs> I, I try to love people. And, and then maybe this was a little strange. Said, well, don't you really like soccer? Don't you pay a lot of attention to soccer? And it seems to be of no use ever, but don't you like it? Yeah, I, I really like soccer. And haven't you been a part of water, water projects before? You, you've helped raise money to put a well in Africa. And, and don't you think that people deserve clean water? Yeah. Then wh why not go? Just go. You don't need some big reason. Just go. Just go. And so I did. And, and I, I, was, I was glad to be a part of it. And when you're there and you, you can't drink the water out of the tap, you can't brush your teeth with it, you begin to realize how significant putting in something. It's a, it is a simple system but how significant and what a benefit it is to the people and to the church. And, and so we put in this water filtration system, two of them, but that's not it. We did a whole lot more. We had vacation Bible school for three days. And part of, part of this, our project was we didn't want to go and, and be the saviors. Sometimes you can go in with that mentality of, well, we've got all the money. We have all this stuff. We're going to save you. We're going to make this uh, right whatever right is. But our goal when we went was not to give them a, a hand up and, and bring them up, but to extend a hand to them and say, we're brothers and sisters in Christ. We're here not to do flashy things, but just partner with you in what you're already doing, what God's already doing here. And one of the, the church we were at is called the Nazareno Cofredia, or the Cofredia Church of the Nazarene. And, and they have an after-school program almost every day that 300 kids come to. And this is not a, a large building. I mean, that, that's actually the building right there. And, well, I'm pointing there. You can't see that. It's behind me, but you know what I mean. And it, it works because the education system in Honduras is, is actually quite poor. That's not to say that they're stupid. They're incredibly bright and intelligent people. But the, the education system is not what it probably should be. And so no matter how old you are, you go to school for half a day. Some of them... Half of them go in the morning, and half of them go in the afternoon. And so the church, they, they, they call it the after-school program, but it's really the before school for some of them and the after school for some of them. If they're an afternoon student at school, they come in the morning to the church, and then vice versa. And so that allows them to have about 150 in the morning and 150 in the afternoon. And we did that with our vacation Bible school, which was run by the church people. We didn't come in and say, here's a great plan for your, your VBS. Here's all the things that we would do and you should do. They, we just said, what, how can we help? What can we do? And we brought a lot of supplies for them. And, and sometimes they, they said, well, we want you to, to do some games. And thankfully, I didn't have to lead that because some of them were these like hand clapping games with singing. And I cannot clap and sing at the same time. It, it's bad. So we let other people do that. But we... We had 250 to 300 children all three days that we did this, and it was a blast. They, they loved it. We loved it. And, and uh, it was really just what we would do here. If you had a vacation Bible school, what would you do? You'd have songs. You'd have Bible stories. And you'd play games. But here's the most important thing. They were building relationships with these students. And they let them know that they're loved, that this is a place for them whether their parents come or not, that you, you can come here. 
This is, this is your church. And, and so the children were welcomed and received, and they had so much fun, in fact, so much fun, that even on the days where there wasn't VBS, they wanted to know what's going on at that church today. And they would come around, and, and we'd put them to work, and, and they would help. It was, uh, it was a really good time, and I don't have statistics other than there were 250 to 300 children, but it, it went very, very well especially the, the balloon animals and things like that. And then we, we did more. We had a wellness clinic, and, and that was three days. We had four or five nurses on our team who, who went, and, and our team it was all people from the Michigan District Church of the Nazarene uh, of all different uh, walks of life. Some of them were nurses. Some of us were pastors. We had a, a woodworker. We had a retired uh, chemical engineer. We had a couple unemployed people, a bus driver. It, it didn't matter. Whatever you do, you, co- you could come and you, you were a part of this. And we tried to use your skills to the, the best of their abilities and, and even skills we didn't know we had. We did a wellness clinic and, and our nurses, they, they set up stations and we had packaged just some very basic things like toothbrushes, toothpaste, some vitamins and deodorant. Uh, what else? I can't remember what else, but there were other things in that bag. And then, so people would come, hundreds of people would come. And the first thing they would do is they would would check their height and their weight and their blood pressure. And then they would go see a nurse, and the nurses had cheat sheets with the body parts in Spanish. And and so they they would learn basic phrases and and ask, you know, do you have pain? Where is your pain? And, And everyone's stomach hurt because the water is not good. Everyone's stomach hurt. Oh, that was the other thing. We had deworming medicine for them. And, and then we also had a Honduran doctor who's associated with the church so that it was uh, something that she was a part of. But also, if there was something a little more serious, our nurses could say, go see the doctor. And our, the nurses, were, they were overjoyed. They were so joyful because they had the opportunity to serve these people and, and just do some very basic things for them. But they also... Devastated is probably the right word. They walked away devastated because there are things we take for granted, like simple antibiotics that just aren't readily available to them. Uh, they, our nurses said, I've never seen so many bad tonsils in my life. Everyone's tonsils were swollen. And it's because bacteria gets back there and sits in the tonsils and they just don't have the antibiotics available to them to, to do something like get rid of tonsillitis. And that grows into a bigger problem. And so we were extremely grateful to serve, but also left, in some ways, thankful for what we have, and our, our doctors who are able to do great things for us, but also knowing that there's so much more that we need to do for, for other people there. And so if you think about it, pray for the people of Honduras and, and just their health, and that the health systems there would, would become a, a better resource for them. And so that was a great time, but also a difficult time. And we not only saw to their, their physical health, but we, we tended to their spiritual health there as well. We had a prayer station set up, and, and we had some, some students from the university who were taking English come, and they did some translating for us. And, and people would come through, and they didn't have to pray, but almost everybody wanted prayer. Many of them already are Christians, and they were just glad to have someone pray over them. Others did not know Christ, but they wanted someone to pray, and 50 people began a relationship with Jesus through this wellness clinic and someone sitting down and praying with them. And so if you think about them, pray that that the Lord would bless them and keep them and that they would would become involved in their church so that the church can, can continue to disciple them and so that they can find how God has gifted them to be a part of his kingdom as well. And that, that was, it was an amazing, amazing time to see 50 people uh, come to the Lord, and, and not only that, but so many people just have some basic needs met that, that weren't otherwise being met, and, and that was pro- that's probably enough, but we did more. We, we were busy. You know, sometimes you hear about these trips, and you say, well, what cool things did you do? Did you zip line? Did you go see a waterfall? We did none of that. We just worked. We worked, and, and it was good. On, on Sunday, one thing you'll learn if you go to another culture is flexibility, Flexibility is key. We don't do well with that in the United States, but flexibility. We were supposed to go to church on Sunday morning and then Sunday school 
and then pack up these bags of food and then drive out somewhere and deliver them, but we weren't going to have time. And so the pastor said, great idea, we'll have church on Saturday night and then Sunday school on Sunday morning and then we'll pack the bags and then you'll have time. And I don't know how he did it, but somehow he got the word out to all of his congregation and we had church on Saturday night on very short notice and everyone was there, at least everyone that I, I think would have been there, I don't know. And, and so we had church Saturday night, Sunday morning, Sunday school, and then we packed bags with some uh, pasta, spaghetti sauce, some cornmeal, sugar, and I'm not a... Cook. I'm not much of a cook, so there were some other things too that they needed and, and they would use and we put them in bags and then we, we loaded up our vans and we drove out to the middle of nowhere. I, I'm not kidding, the middle of nowhere, mountains, I have no idea where we were. A dirt road with some houses along the road. And we broke up into groups of five with one local person from the church who could translate and we just went from house to house. And, and our, our Spanish speaker would would go and they would say, Hello, hi, we're from the, the Church of the Nazarene. And, and we, were wonder, we were just wondering, how many, how many people are in your home? And, and they would tell us, they're, they're much more open to people coming to their homes than we are. And, and they'd tell us, and, and then we would, would say, could you use this food? And, and we would give, everyone takes it. They, they were, it was a very poor area. And they would receive the food, and then we would ask, can, can we pray for you in, in English? And they would say, everyone said yes. Some of them were believers, and you knew it because they would pray right alongside of you. And, and then others were drunk, and they would say, yeah, you can pray for me. And they had no idea what I was praying, and so I would pray that the Lord would, would help them to get sober. But not only that, but the Lord would, would bless them. And, and it, was, it was a great time. And in that, what we were doing, we were also inviting them to come and see a film, the, the Jesus film. And uh, we were in the middle of nowhere, and somehow, 150 people showed up to watch the Jesus film, and it was at a church plant. We were at the Cofredia Church of the Nazarene, or Nazareno Cofredia, and this was a church plant of theirs, and it's at a house. There are actually two houses that the, the different members of the family own right next to each other, and so we set up our, our screen and our, our solar-powered projector and, and um, amplifier, and we were, had all our plastic chairs ready to go, and all the people were there, and it started to pour down rain. Flexibility again. What do we do? And I'm thinking everybody's going to be running home. No one left. What we did is we just took our, our things down, and there was a little bit of a, a, an overhang on their porches. And so we set up the screen at the edge of one of the porches with the, the projector behind it and the, the amplifier back there. And people just crowded underneath the porch uh, on one side and then underneath the, the other porch. And, and those of you who were here when the Cunninghams were here, it showed you the screen. And one of the benefits of the screen that they use is you can watch this movie from both sides. We were very grateful because initially we were going to watch from one side, but we needed both sides. And, and people crowded in. And I, I was in the back, the way back. That's, I don't know, I'm comfortable there. Uh, for all of you back row people, you know how it is back there. You're hardly ever paying attention, right? Uh, and maybe not, maybe not, sorry. He, I know it's different here. You all are far better than me. But when we, at the Jesus film, the people in the back were your stereotypical back row people. They were talking to each other, not paying attention, and I was kind of leaning against the back wall. And, and what was amazing to see is as the, the movie progressed, Jesus' life progresses, you, we got to the, the point where he's arrested, and the people in the back, they got quiet. And they started to stand up because, oh, I want to see what's going on. And it had stopped raining at that point. And, and, and as Jesus is crucified, they, they had, now they had moved their chairs out to the, the main area. And they were cr cringing and turning away as Jesus is crucified. And then it gets to the resurrection. And I'm not kidding. They picked up their chairs and they're moving closer and closer. The, the story of Christ literally drew them in. And, and, and at the end, Pastor Jose, he... He offered to pray with people. He, he asked if anyone would like to know Jesus. And, and many people raised their hands, but only two came up for prayer. And, and our missionary, I didn't tell you this, I should have. Our missionaries who hosted us were Jason, and I just forgot his wife's name. I am so sorry. Jason and his wife, the Courtney's. The Courtney's, they, they were there. And, and Jason, he said afterwards, remember, there were two people who prayed. There were a lot who raised their hands, 
But we don't know the results. We don't know the kingdom results of this, and we probably won't know until we see the Lord again. And so we keep praying that the, the fruit of that time would multiply and grow, and that this church plant w- would be a good church for those people to come and, and engage with, with the risen Lord. And, and it, was, it was a wonderful time. Again, flexibility and, and just seeing what God does. And, and I'm looking at my notes. It, it just it captivates you. I didn't understand a word they were saying. And, and yet to see the way that they're drawn into to the, the life of Christ. And, and then we, some of, seven of us were, were able to go to the university and attend the English class. They're first-year English students, and this was an unexpected opportunity. The, the teacher of the English class attends the Cofordia Church, and she said, would some of you be able to come and have conversations with my students? They don't, how often do you get an opportunity to practice what you're trying to learn with those who speak it? And so seven of us, seven of us were able to go, and this was, it was an interesting day. I w- most days I did physical labor and I was so tired when I got back to the hotel and, and it was time for bed and I crashed. I was more tired from this day than I was from the others because I'm an introvert and I don't like to be the center of attention, but when you're the gringo, the, the white person, <laughs> the, you are the center of attention. And, and so we, we had these conversations and, and then after everyone wants to take your picture and, and and it was a special day there. They were have, the art students and the music students were, were putting on a, a sort of festival for the school, and we were the guests of honor even though we didn't know it. And so we, the way they do it is they're on the stage, and, and if you're the guest, you sit on the stage on the sides, and then all of the other students, they're out looking, looking upon them. And I didn't know that this was a hired person, but they hired some entertainment, a mime. And my worst nightmare came true. He, he pointed at me, he's like, you, over here. So I had to go over, and he, he had me kneel down and put some kind of tray on my head, and I really don't know what was happening up there. But they tell me that there were some clay models that were dancing or something, and, and I, that was done. I, oh, whew, that wasn't too bad. I just had to kneel there, and everyone stared at me, but it wasn't too bad. I went and sat down, and then he pointed at me again. He's like, you, come here. And I shouldn't... I should, probably shouldn't even be sharing this because it is embarrassing. <laughs> but he, he had me come up there, and, and he pointed at all of these clothes on the ground and put them on. It was the motion. I thought it, the students were being graded. And I thought he was a student, so I don't want to ruin this guy's grade. I, I'll, all right, I'll do it. So I, I'm putting all the clothes on, and, and then the music starts, and he gives me the, like, take them off. I looked at my team members like, I'm a Nazarene pastor. I can't do this. <laughs> what do, uh, but the, I don't want to ruin his grade. What do I do? So I gave it the half-hearted uh, effort, and everyone laughed at me, and I got made fun of every day after by my team members. And I now have eight Honduran girlfriends. I, <laughs> they said, if you need to get married, go back to Honduras. All right, I, I'll make a note of that. So that was the embarrassing but funny stuff. But here's the really good part about that day at the university. We, they asked us the questions you learn in your first-year language classes. What's your name? How old are you? Are you married? No. Why not? How, what, how, do you have kids? And, and, and th- in their culture, it's, it's just not unusual for young women, uh, girls I would even call them, to have children. And so for me, they're asked, how old are you, 29? Do you have kids? No, what? Why not? And I got to explain, I think it's better to be married and have kids. And, and I know that's not always the circumstance, but I, I think that's better. And, and, and then here's, here was the good thing. They'd ask me, what's your job? What do you do for work? Trabajo. And, and I, I said, I, I'm a pastor. And said, well, I don't know why, but every, we rotated groups. And every single group would say, well, what's the name of your church? Hope Church of the Nazarene, we just call it Hope or Hope Church. And then, oh, and then they would tell me about Honduras. And, and they would tell me about how much they need hope. They would tell me about the, the economic situation, the political situation, the fact that people just don't have enough food, they don't have clean water, and they'd say, we need hope. And, and I got to share the gospel with them, and I'd say, you're right, you do. And, and those things can get better. But our real hope is Jesus Christ. And then I would remind them that the hope that they have and that they need is the exact same hope that the United States needs. 
Uh, our problem is maybe different. We have way too much, but we, have, we need the same hope, and it's Jesus Christ. And, and I got to share all of that with them, and, and so despite the, what would come after, the embarrassment, it was worth going, and it was one of my favorite days uh, of sharing the gospel with, with some who knew and some who didn't. And, and I don't know if anyone was, was saved, but again, we're not going to know the fruit uh, until the Lord comes back. Uh, so, so was that it? No, more. There was more. Our, our big project was the soccer field. We, we went to, to build a soccer field, and this soccer field, it's not a full-length, uh, regulation-sized field. It's a smaller field. They call it speed soccer. And it's a, a turf field with a little bit of concrete block laid around it, some fencing, nets, and lights. And, and the, the pastor whose vision this was, his, his name is Pastor Christian. He's from Tegucigalpa, which is the capital of Honduras. And he's, he told us one night at dinner, he, he shared how this all came about. And he said, 10 years ago, I, I woke up, and I don't know if it was a dream or a vision, whatever you would call it, and God spoke to me. And he said, Christian, this, you need to build a soccer field for, for the children. And, and so Christian, he, he said he, he got up, and, and maybe a week or so later, he went to the leaders of, of the church, and his dad was one of them, and he said, here's what the Lord's told me. We need to build a soccer field. And they all said, no. That seems like a bad idea. But he, Christian wasn't going to be deterred, and he, he had his own church. And so what he did is he basically gutted the sanctuary. He took all of the pews out, and he moved them to the upstairs of the church and made a sanctuary up there. And then he built a soccer field in what used to be their sanctuary. And the church had 25 children coming to, to their, on, on Sundays. And, and now they have about 125 children, and this has only been a few years and, and so we asked him, so what does your dad think now? And he said, well, my dad wants one at his church too. <laughs> and and we, we built the second one. And, and this is the culmination of a, a dream from 10 years ago. But also the, the local pastor, Pastor Jose, he, he told us, we have been praying for 10 years that God would give us something to reach out to our community, a way to, to invest in them, but also to to let them know the gospel. And, and so this is the answer to a 10-year prayer as well. And he asked all of us to say thank you to the Michigan District for this gift that God is going to use to, to bless Don Lee and specifically Cofordia, which is the neighborhood, and, and, and far beyond. And one of the beautiful things about the, this, it's called Nazagol. That's the program. One of the great things about it is it's not just a soccer field. It's church. When the kids come, there is a... a oh, I f did we watch the video? We didn't watch the video. We'll watch that at the end, uh, I think. We, there's a, a soccer ball. That, it's a vanja ball. It has different colors on it that, that tell the gospel story. And so at the field, they have one of these. And, and before games or after games, they will present the gospel with this. And then the, the local church will disciple them. There's a discipleship program for, for those who come to the soccer field and then in the, the evenings, they'll rent the field out to, to earn some income to, to maintain the turf and replace it when it's necessary. And so it's not just, you built this for us, it's good for a while, then it, it goes bad and nothing happened from it. They have a plan to, to maintain it, but more than that, to evangelize and disciple the, these children, and they'll do some adult leagues as well. And it was, it was so much work. I, I'm, a, I'm a pastor I have no other marketable skills, but let me tell you, I was, I was shoveling and moving dirt and carrying five-gallon bucket after five-gallon bucket of cement. If it was heavy, I had to do it, pretty much. <laughs> I was the young guy on the team. And, but in that work, we, some of the, the men from the church, they didn't get paid to do this. They came, and they were working alongside of us, and we don't, hardly any of us spoke Spanish, and they don't speak English and you're trying to do a construction project together, and, and it worked because you, you pick up on a word here or there, but mostly we're, we were united in the project because we didn't just see a field. We knew what this was for. And, and like any, uh, there's things we think, oh, they're so different than us. We are far more alike than, than we are different. There are things that are cross-cultural, and some of them are funny. Uh, we're mostly guys, and someone passes gas, and, and, and they would yell, Bomba! 
And then pretty soon everyone's yelling Bomba, and, and one of the guys on our team became known, known as Big Bomba. <laughs> and you, you just have fun. You build relationships. You don't speak each other's language, but you share a heart language. You, you share the bonds of the Spirit, and you find ways uh, of connecting and building relationships that go beyond language. And it, was, it was just incredible to see the way that the Hondurans and, and the, the Michiganders were, were working together for, for one goal. And then we, I want to remind you uh, that we have simple tools. There are some simple, simple tools at our disposal. And while we were there, we used a soccer ball that had different colors on it to tell the gospel and to have fun. And we used bracelets that had those same colors on them. And, and we used food to, to go house to house and bless them, even if they didn't come to the movie, to bless them with a simple tool like food. We used a film and, and a projector. And most of all, we allowed ourselves to be used by God in whatever ways he would ask of us. And so I want to remind you that you don't have to go to Honduras. You don't have to go anywhere. There are simple things, everyday things at our disposal that God can use for us to, to share the kingdom of God, the, the gospel, which is Jesus Christ, with others. And so we're going to be praying for holy, sanctified imaginations to see the everyday things as ways that God can, can do extraordinary things. Because everything we did there was actually quite ordinary. We had wellness checks. They checked blood pressure and, and asked them, do you have pain? We built a soccer field, which meant we moved dirt here, and then when the other contractor didn't like it, we moved the dirt over here, just for them to tell us to move it back here. And it just is ordinary stuff. We, we moved wheelbarrows and used shovels. And, and we had a VBS. We do that here. Just everyday things, and yet God uses them in extraordinary ways. And so we were praying that God would open our eyes to what those ordinary, everyday things are, and that we would allow ourselves just ordinary people. We're all just ordinary people to be used in extraordinary ways for the sake of God's kingdom. And then, I'm almost done. I want to remind you that children are the church. Children are not good to have, glad you're here. They are the church alongside of us. And, and we, we took one member of our, one member of our team. He's, his name is Ford Mulder. He is 11 years old. And, and when, I, when I heard he was coming, I didn't know him. I thought, 11 years old? What's he going to do? We're installing water, for, water filtration systems, wellness clinics. I know he's not a nurse. And building a soccer field, he looks kind of scrawny. Not sure if he can even lift a shovel. But I'm so glad he went because he was our greatest evangelistic tool while we were there. He, he just played. He played with the kids. He, he showed love to them, and he was loved as well. He was our greatest tool. If he didn't go, we would not have done nearly as well as we did. And, and so I, I was reminded not to discount the young people. He is incredibly important to the kingdom of God and incredibly important to, to the mission of the church. And then the Lord really hit me upside the head. I have known, and I'm going to talk about my church a little bit, Hope Church, that what the Lord has called us to do is to really focus on children. And I've argued with him. I said, but God, you know that we have 40 people on Sunday, and that's on a good Sunday. We need more adults. How are, we can't do this if we don't have more adults. And so I've been trying to think of ways to get more adults. And, and, and right before the trip, the Lord really made some things clear to me. And while I was there, to see the Cofredia Church of the Nazarene and the way that they embrace children and youth, the niños and jóvenes, children and youth, that they are not just uh, attenders. They are a part of that church. And so they have these plastic chairs. That's all they have. And the adults sit about halfway up the sanctuary and back. And then they have all these tiny little plastic chairs for the kids, and they're in the front. And, and they, they're just free to be there. And if they have to go to the bathroom, they get up and they go to the bathroom. And they come back and no one makes a big deal about it. And if one of them's crying, that's okay. It doesn't matter. And, and not only that, but the children and the youth are the ushers. They're the worship team. They, they're part of the, the scripture reading team. They're prayers. They are not 
just a, a good thing to have so that people see we have children. They are a part of the church. And the Lord reminded me, you could do a better job of letting the kids and the youth know that they are, this is their church. And, and they are equipped to serve in, in ways that we, we don't even think that they're ready for. And so we need to be willing to do that. And so I hope we've got some changes coming up that, that we're going to be doing. And I, I won't tell you all about those, but unless you're dying to know. But we, we have some changes to, to let the children and the youth know this is your church. And, and not only do you attend, but you serve, you're a part of it. It's yours. And, and, and I, I'm excited about that. And, and I, here's what I learned. Is that sometimes, I learned a lot of things. I always tell my church, if I could just teach you one thing, and then the next week it's, if I could just teach you one thing, it's a lot of things. But one of the things that, that I really learned is we, we sometimes have an attitude that the, the American church or the Western church knows how to do church because we have all of the, the good things, the projectors and, and the sound systems and, and the programs. We know how to do church. But I, my pride was corrected a little bit. As we were there, I was, reminded, or I was reminded that they know how to do church too. And it doesn't look exactly the same as the way we do it, but it is good and it is pleasing to the Lord, and I could learn something from them. They can learn from us too, but we can learn something from other cultures and other churches as well. We are not the, the be-all and end-all of church. Uh, we're glad for the American church, but the Lord's church is worldwide. And I, I'm excited for our new members today because you joined this local church, but you also joined the Global Church of the Nazarene, which is at work in Honduras and, and 100 and, I don't even know, 64-ish world areas. You're part of that church too. And, and we're a part of the Cofredia Church of the Nazarene. The Lord's work, it, it's not just here. It's all over. And I want to close with a scripture Ephesians chapter 1, verses 18 through 19a, which says, I pray that the eyes, I gotta start over, sorry. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance and his holy people, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. We have a hope, and that hope is Jesus Christ, and it is the same hope of Honduras. And so our prayer is that our eyes would be opened to the hope of Christ and that it wouldn't just be for us, but for all of the world. And not only that, but that he has given us the same power that resurrected Jesus Christ from the dead. And when we have that power, the Lord can accomplish anything. And so we go in that power. And, and we're going to watch the video that I forgot to watch at the beginning. I got so excited, I, I forgot. Let's watch that and then I'll, I'll come back up for a moment.
Well, I wanted, I wanted to come back up after the video because I wanted to just talk a, a little bit. You saw the, the gentleman with the soccer ball speaking to those boys. That was Pastor Christian who, who had the vision for Nazagol. And, and that wasn't scripted. We didn't say, hey, it would be really good to get video uh, of him presenting the gospel and, and praying with some boys. That, that was just four, the 11-year-old boy went out and played soccer with some kids in the street and, and then Pastor Christian took the opportunity to tell them the gospel through this so evangelism soccer ball. And those three boys accepted Christ that day. Everyday stuff. Just a willing heart and trusting that the, the power of the resurrected Lord is working in us. And his word will not return void. And, and so I, I was privileged to go. Thanks for lending your pastor to my church for two weeks so that I could. And I, if you want to know more, I didn't even touch the surface of what happened there. We just don't have time. But if you want to know more, I'd be happy to share more pictures with you and talk about it in and, and the weeks to come. And let's pray, and then a benediction. Lord, we, we're grateful for the hope that we have, and that, that we, as we approach Advent, we're, we're reminded that, that our hope isn't unfounded. Our hope is there because you came. And you lived among us. You showed us what it is to live an ordinary life in many ways, to be one, two, three, four, five years old and doing things like learning to talk and, and, and doing the dishes and things like that, that they can be holy and sanctified when we're doing them for the kingdom of God. And Lord, we know that we have hope because you haven't left us and abandoned us, but you have given us the Spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit. And we pray that that power would well up within us. That we'd be reminded that we are disciples who are called to make disciples. And, and that as we do that, you are the one who equips us and prepares us. You are the one who, who teaches us what to say. And, and Lord, we are so grateful for it. And we have a hope that you are coming again. And while we work and while we labor alongside of you, we're reminded that at your coming, that is where we'll see the fruit. That's where we'll be in full knowing that your word has not returned void. And so we pray that you would be with the people of Honduras, that you'd bless them and keep them, Lord, that, that these children would never stray to the left or to the right, but would always walk with you. And we pray for our churches in Battle Creek, Lord, that we would be the same, that we would be united through the bonds of the Spirit, and that we'd be reminded that our hope rests upon you, and that you have so much in store for us. May we be ready, may we be willing, and may we have holy and sanctified imaginations to see what you've already blessed us with, and may we use it for the sake of your kingdom. We ask it in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, would you stand for the benediction? May the peace of the Lord Christ go with you wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors. Amen.